you remember a few months ago, I was very scared, like hiding everything about myself, hiding about where I exist now, where I live. And because I was in a very tough situation, as you know, escaping from Egypt within three hours, escaping death threats and also legal claims and charges accusing me of committing high treason and in de- in endangering national security and also spying for Israel. So all of that put me under big pressure. I had to hide for a while. But thank God, things are improving. It seems perhaps God has brought me here to the United States. I now live in Washington, D.C. for a reason. And this reason is to bring here the perspective of the Middle East, the real Middle East, as we know it as Middle Easterners, to the decision makers and policy makers in the United States. Defending Israel with David Harris on JBS is made possible in part by a generous gift in memory of Eric and Mira J. Spector, the Paul and Lynn Late Family Foundation to life to love, Barbara and Bob Goodkind, the Patricia Worthen Allman Foundation. Hello, JBS viewers. I'm David Harris, and this is Defending Israel. Since October the 7th, we've had a number of extraordinary guests, and some of you have asked for several of them to return. Last week, listening to you, we brought back Natasha Hausdorff, the British lawyer. And this week, I'm very pleased that we brought back Dalia Ziada. For those of you who may not know her, uh, I would call her a human rights activist, a peace activist, a coexistence activist, a democracy activist, and a very brave person, as you're about to see. Dahlia, welcome back. Thank you so much, David. And uh, I, I would also add to the amazing titles you've given me, a supporter of Israel and the Jewish people worldwide, because this is one of the things I'm very proud of. And we are immensely admiring and grateful. And I think that's why our viewers wanted you to come back. I think, by the way, that the show with you may have been the single most watched show in the entire series since the fall. So we're really happy to have you again, Dahlia. Now, first of all, I'm I'm very excited to hear that. Thank you. Now, first of all, I know there have been some changes in your life since our last show. So bring our viewers up to date on what you're doing and where are you? So if you remember a few months ago, I was very scared, like hiding everything about myself, hiding about where I exist now, where I live. And because I was in a very tough situation, as you know, escaping from Egypt within three hours, escaping death threats and also legal claims and charges accusing me of committing high treason and in, de- in endangering national security and also spying for Israel. So all of that put me under big pressure. I had to hide for a while. But thank God things are improving. It seems perhaps God has brought me here to the United States. I now live in Washington, D.C. for a reason. And this reason is to bring here the perspective of the Middle East, the real Middle East, as we know it as Middle Easterners, to the decision makers and policy makers in the United States. We are, uh, recently I started a new role uh, as, or a new affiliation, I would say, with uh, a think tank in Israel that also is starting new operations here in the United States. It's called the Jerusalem Center for Foreign Affairs, and its mission is exactly in line with my mission to bring the true image about the Middle East to the United States policymakers and decision makers. First of all, as as an American citizen, I couldn't be happier for our country that you are now in this country. Uh, And secondly, your voice explaining the real Middle East, as you call it, and not the illusions that too often uh, pervade Washington is so important. So the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs is lucky to have you, and we're fortunate to be with you uh, in the United States. Let's get down to some issues, okay? 
Yes. So since we last spoke, there's been much more focus on Egypt, uh, and in particular, Rafah. Since the Israelis moved into Rafah and discovered countless tunnels and so forth, the myth, if you will, Dahlia, of the convergence of interests between Egypt and Israel regarding the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas seems to have been challenged or punctured. Uh, the storyline had been Egypt and, Is and Israel have the same interests. Hamas is the enemy of both as an exponent of the Muslim Brotherhood. Therefore, they're fighting on the same side. Are Egypt and Israel today fighting on the same side? Uh, let me start by this. Unfortunately, right now, as we speak at this moment, no, Egypt and Israel are not fighting on the same side anymore, but they still face the same enemy. The difference is that Israel start, decided to be more decisive in dealing with this enemy by launching war. And this enemy, I'm speaking about Iran, its proxies, and Hamas, and Islamist groups that target not only the national security of Israel, but the national security also of Arab countries, especially, especially the immediate neighbors of Israel, like Egypt and Jordan. But the thing is that because Israel is a strong democratic country that fears, that does not fear its own people, that, that I believe everyone knows exactly what they want to do. They all, they all on one heart and one soul and one goal, I believe. It was able to become more decisive in dealing with these terrorist organizations, especially when it came to the point of committing a crime as horrible as uh, October 7 attack on Israeli civilians. Israel reached a point where it cannot anymore negotiate with these terrorist organizations or negotiate with its sponsor, Iran. Now is the time just to crush them. Arab countries did not, go, did not get to this point yet, including Egypt, unfortunately, for many reasons. One of them is that domestically, the popularity of the leadership in Egypt, I mean the president, the president and also the military institution, which is the de facto ruler of the country right now, is declining because of bad political situation and bad economic situation. The economic crisis we're witnessing now in Egypt, we've not seen in our entire history, in our entire history, literally. So with all this happening, the government or the leadership in Egypt could not afford the outrage that may come or may be doubled by the general public who at one, on one side will be angry at the government because of its bad performance in politics and economy, but also very sympathetic with Hamas and this rhetoric about you know Muslims against the Jews and the war uh, that Hamas is a resistance group and all this stuff. So to appease this pop general public or to play for this domestic audience, the Egyptian leadership had to show support to Hamas at the beginning of the war and all of a sudden cut off Israel as an ally and even refused and not even refused to support Israel in its war in Hamas. Egypt went as far as blaming Israel for committing for, for starting this war in retaliation to the crimes that Hamas committed against Israeli civilians, rather than uh, taking the side of Israel in this war. So as a result of all of this, unfortunately, it's like a, snow, a snowball. The more you show support to the side of extremists, the more it gets bigger. And now it got too big that it's now threatening the Egyptian leadership itself. The Muslim Brotherhood are once again the ones who are leading the public opinion in Egypt. The extremist Salafist groups who are very similar to the jihadist groups like the Islamic Jihad in Gaza, uh, uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and all these groups, these radical Islamist groups are now the ones who are controlling the public opinion in Egypt. And sooner or later, they will be a serious threat to the leadership in Egypt, which has already, which tried before to reject them and control them. So Egypt in a very tough situation. This is from one side on the domestic level, also on the regional level. For a few years now, Egypt has been falling under the influence of Qatar. I'm 
I'm very sad to say that, but it's also for financial reasons. When the United Arab Emirates and other moderate and Saudi Arabia and other moderate countries in the region decided to stop funding uh, the government, like the leadership in Egypt, because of their practice, uh, corrupt practices and not using the money given to them by these countries into projects that really lead to the welfare of the people or to the development of the country. Moderate countries in the region, moderate rich countries in the region, in the region like Saudi Arabia and UAE, decided to stop funding Egypt. So Egypt went to Qatar and reconciled with Qatar and accordingly fell under the influence of Qatar in all the decisions it is making on regional issues, as we are seeing now in, in the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. Wow. Uh and for JBS viewers, let's remember Qatar has come up more than once um, in this programming. Uh, it is a country whose leadership uh, has taken a spiritual oath, a bayah, to the Muslim Brotherhood. It is the same country that ISCAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy, has been fingering for its support, direct and indirect, of American universities, American higher education. Uh, and it is the country that got caught in Brussels, having sought to influence through money a number of European uh, Parliament members. So this, this is a big story you're telling us here. And you might add, Dahlia, perhaps you'll say a word. Egypt has now joined the accusation of genocide that was initially launched by South Africa, uh, and Turkey uh, joined, and now Egypt has joined formally accusing Israel of genocide, correct? That's correct. Unfortunately, Egypt recently joined the ICJ uh, accusations. That's the uh, International ICJ Court of claims, Justice. Yes, uh, claims against Israel of committing genocide. Uh, although for, for, for any, I mean, for any average researcher, he can easily be ruled prove that this is not the case, but the fact that all these countries are packing these charges is is really something serious, is an indication that something serious is happening uh, behind the closed doors. And I think the hands of Qatar and Iran are not far from this. If you look at all the countries that are supporting the claims, starting from Egypt, Turkey, and even South Africa, which started these claims at, at the very beginning, all of them, Qatar has huge investments in their economy. Qatar has a huge influence on them. And I think somehow Qatar used this economic leverage on these countries to support uh, this claim without Qatar appearing in the picture, without Qatar appearing as someone who wants to bring troubles to Israel, but only appear as a mediator, as we are seeing now, which I think it's not serving anyone, anyone other than Hamas. So uh, so this is, this is what we're seeing now. And yeah, Qatar influence is very high, as you just mentioned, David, it's uh, not only on the Middle East country, countries, Qatar is also influencing the narrative about the Middle East in Western countries, including in, in big capitals, in, in the capital of the world, the Washington DC, Qatar is influencing how the Middle East is viewed in, in these uh, capitals, in these Western capitals. So Dalia, you are now in Washington DC, which means that you are a taxi ride or an Uber ride away from the White House. For argument's sake, the White House calls you and says, Dalia, You've brought new ideas to, to Washington. The president would like to meet with you. Uh, and in particular, he'd like to discuss with you uh, Egypt and American policy towards Egypt, Qatar and American policy towards Qatar. Could you share with us what would you whisper in the ear of the president of the United States on those issues? Uh, thank you. That's a very good exercise to do. And I wish really it will happen in reality one day because I think Inshallah. Of, I hope I hope because really, really one of the things that Washington lacks the most is an authentic perspective about the Middle East, about what's really happening in the houses, in the streets of the people in the Middle East. And this is a perspective that only insiders can give 
to policymakers here in the U.S. And I can't claim that I am one of these insiders. I just came from Egypt a few months ago, and I've been working on studying the geopolitics of the region for so long. So the challenge in the Middle East right now is that the United States, it's, it's not that the United States is supporting the bad actors or the evil guys in the region, but that it has laid down, is that it's that the United States laid down its support to the good people in the region, to its best allies in the region. And this unfortunately happened since day one, uh, President Biden came in power and we've seen like he, he dropped uh, his support to uh, the American support to its important allies like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and removed the Houthis from uh, the terrorist uh, organizations, the foreign terrorist organizations list from this designation, and even tried to renew the deal with Iran, which has already failed in the past and did not work in the past. All these, and also the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So all these policies over the years accumulated into the result that we've seen right now in the aftermath of the October 7 attacks, that these bad actors in the region, these evil actors in the region were so empowered that when October 7 attacks happened, they were the only voice speaking in the region on behalf of the Middle East, the only voice that is uh, that is educating the West about the Middle East, the only voice that is influencing the West about the Middle East. And all the good people, all the moderate people, all the moderate voices has been already marginalized because their relationship with the United States has been torn somehow or weakened uh, to a certain extent. Also, something really interesting we've seen in the past, in, in the past, let's say five or seven years, is this big wave of reconciliations and de-escalations that happened in the Middle East uh, immediately after Abraham Accords happened. Abraham Accords was a great, great, great moment in our modern history. Uh, it marked like a new era for Arab-Israeli relations. It really gave a very big promise that all the sufferings we are have we we've been dealing with in the region for years and years is now coming to an end because the so-called Palestinian cause that terrorists used to uh, recruit uh, new new militants uh, or new members of their terrorist organizations and even corrupt governments used in Arab countries, corrupt governments used to uh, distract the people from their internal problems. And so now we have the promise that this is coming to an end. And we are finally starting a new age in the Arab-Israeli relations. Of course, Iran did not like that. Qatar did not like that. And Turkey did not like that. I could, uh, not I, but many people call them the axis of evil. So this axis of evil just decided to step up and disturb what happened. And their first step to do that was what the, the wave of reconciliations that we have seen in the past five years. And I think they were some kind of masked influence or masked attempts to influence this new dynamic of the relationship between Arabs and Israel. Uh, because they intervened as sheep, you know, I mean, they are very nice, very kind, let's all reconcile, let's, you know, have good relations, let's finally de-escalate the tensions in the region, but actually they were wolves, wolves masked as sheep. They were not there for reconciliation, but to disturb the flower, the, the new flower of Arab-Israeli relations that were just blossoming after Abraham Accords were signed. And here we are paying the price for this now, unfortunately. Dalia, I don't want to drag you into partisan politics in the United States, especially on the eve of a big presidential election. But you, you, you made the point, I think very consciously, that this began with the start of the Biden administration are, are you speaking about a broader American problem in a failure to understand the dynamics of the Middle East or a more specific problem within one of the two political parties? 
I don't think it's it's a specific problem for one of the two political parties in the United States. It's not like that. It's actually a problem with how the leadership in general, how the administrations, whether Republican or Democrat or the people who make decisions in the United States, let's put it this way, perceive the Middle East for about 10 years now. It's not only about the, the last four years of President Biden, but for a while, the Middle East is not seen, especially after the experience of the Arab Spring and the um, fact that not many countries that went through the Arab Spring has eventually succeeded to be democracies. So the feeling in Washington started to be like, OK, we tried our best in the Middle East and no need to try anymore. Let's just accept the status quo if they want to be dictators, let them be dictators. If Qatar want to do uh, to support terrorist organizations, let it support terrorist organizations. Uh, Afghanistan is not important to us anymore. So in general, the Middle East did not become as important as it has always been. And this, again, uh, something that has been happening, I would say, for 10 years or so, because the disbelief of America in the outcomes of the Arab Spring or because of the failure of the Arab Spring, I would say. So as a result, we are seeing now that the Middle East has not become important for the for Washington decision makers, and thus it has not become as important as before to the think tanks and to the academia in the United States. And thus the research done on the Middle East, the people who are working on the Middle East, their numbers shrank dramatically. And then in 2014 and 2013, they were replaced by the waves of Islamist uh, scholars and non-scholars and academ uh, academics and non-academics who came to the United States as refugees running from uh, countries like Egypt and other Arab countries when they started to push the Muslim Brotherhood out of these countries. So they became now these Muslim Brotherhood people are the so-called experts in most of the think tanks in, in Washington and in most of uh, academic institutions in the United States. And thus, they are they will not do anything in support of Israel or in support of Arab-Israeli peace as we understand it. They will do everything that will serve their group, first of all, the Muslim Brotherhood, and all the Islamist affiliated groups in the region like Hamas, which is also part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, JBS viewers, what you just heard is quite extraordinary. And I hope JBS viewers include the White House, the State Department, the National Security Council, uh, both parties in the US Congress, um, in the think tanks, because what, what Dahlia is saying as clearly as can be is we have totally misread the Middle East we also think we can begin to turn our back on the Middle East and focus elsewhere, including Asia. And we can somehow manage the status quo. And Dahlia, if I'm understanding you correctly, none of those things are true. To the contrary, what's happening in the Middle East is contrary to fundamental American interests, geopolitical uh, and values based. So Dahlia, Absolutely. your voice needs to be heard loud and clear in the halls of power in Washington. I want to turn in our remaining minutes to another very important issue, certainly for us, for me. There's always this notion, Dahlia, that uh, in the Arab world, we're not anti-Semitic. We never had a Holocaust in the Arab world, unlike Europe. We just have our problems with Israel. And if those problems were solved, everything else would go away. I was doing some work um, earlier today and I came upon the Pew Research Study. And Pew is one of the most respected names in survey research. It has no agenda or ax to grind. And they studied seven Muslim countries in 2019, the most recent survey I found. 98% of those surveyed in Egypt said they have a negative view, not of Israel, but of Jews. In Jordan and Lebanon, the number was even higher, if you can imagine, higher than 98%. So talk to us about anti-Semitism and not just anti-Israelism 
um, in the world that you know best. And then add for our viewers, I know we touched on it last time, but they may not have seen it. How did you end up in the other 2%? <laughs> okay, wow, what a question. So let's start by the statistics. Yes, I think they are very true uh, to the reality that's happening on the ground there in the Arab world. Uh, one living proof that we've lived on this level of anti-Semitism in the Arab world and hatred toward the Jews in the Arab world is what we've seen in the aftermath of October 7 attacks. As horrific as the attacks were raping women killing children, burning people alive, burning houses, uh, kidnapping people. All of this was, I'm very sad to say, I'm very ashamed to say actually, was celebrated by Arabs and Muslims, was celebrated. They did not only disregard what happened or ignored what happened, they celebrated it. Why? Because it happened to Jewish people. It's true, like, Many people in, in the Arab world and the Muslim world, they say, we are also Semites. How can you accuse us of being anti-Semitic? There is nothing called anti-Semitism in the Arab world. Okay, maybe the term of anti-Semitism does not apply to Arabs and Muslims as a term, as a definition, but in reality, there is a huge amount of hatred toward this Israel as a country, toward this uh, the Jewish people as Jewish people and toward this even those who, who, who say that they support Israel or the Jewish people. And I think the biggest proof on that is how Arabs celebrated the, after, uh, the October 7 attacks, how they were so happy and publicly celebrating it on media, in streets, everywhere, just because it was committed against Jewish people. And that's the reason why they now support a terrorist organization like Hamas, a terrorist organization like Hezbollah, and a terrorist organization like the Houthis, simply because they are fighting the Jewish people. Unfortunately, this has deep roots in both Islamic and Arabic culture. In the Arabic culture, I think maybe many people read or knew that in ancient times, long before Islam appears, there were fights between the tribe from which Prophet Muhammad came and Islam started and some other tribes uh, in, in the Hijaz uh, area, in the Hijaz region, which is now Saudi Arabia and the surrounding Gulf region. There were historical conflicts between the tribe where Prophet Muhammad has come from and Islam started and the other tribes that were Jewish tribes and already existed there. And these conflicts were mainly economic and political conflicts. It's a fight over economic resources. It was not really something has to do with religion. When Islam came, it gave an Islamic uh, or a religious layer to this conflict between these Arab tribes and these Jewish tribes in the Hijaz area. Until today, in some of the protesters that are showing support to, uh, to Hamas and the Free Palestine protesters and so, they use a very interesting slogan. They say, Khaybar, Khaybar, Ya Yahud, Gaish Muhammad, Sawfa Yahud. What this means, it means uh, it, it, they call upon a tribe, a Jewish tribe that was known at that time, it's called Khaybar, Khaybar tribe. So they are saying, hey, the Jewish people of Khaybar, Daesh Muhammad Safa Yaud means the army of Muhammad is coming back to kill you. So it, it shows you how much it is related what we are living today, this complexity of the conflict that we are seeing today, and how much it is rooted in, in our Arab and Islamic history. And actually, if you think about it, really, the conflict itself is, is not as big as we are seeing it. It's only a conflict over a piece of land similar to many other conflicts in the region. But because of this Islamic and, and, and cultural layer, it got more and more complicated. I wish we had more time because you've really skimmed the surface of a hugely important issue that I think many people, again, including many Jews, 
totally misunderstand and underestimate. So we might have to invite you back once again, Dalia. But in the meantime, uh, JBS viewers, uh, we sometimes cheapen language these days. Uh, the word hero, for example. A hero may be someone who scores a basket in the last minute and wins a game. No. Heroes are people who are filled with moral courage, moral outrage, and the physical valor and courage to match their moral courage and outrage. You've just spent 30 minutes with one of those true heroes, Dahlia Ziada. Dahlia, thank you for not just being with us, but thank you for your fight. Thank you so much, David. It's, it's, it's always amazing to be with you. Thank you so much. JBS viewers, this is David Harris, Defending Israel. Looking forward to seeing you again next week. Mm -hmm.